And turning your Bible to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9, I'm going to read that. I'm going to talk today about why you should be established as a Christian with spiritual milk and not meat. We're going to look about this subject today. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 9. It says here, Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Uh, people need to return to milk. I'm going to be talking about that in this study today. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This is an old sermon, by the way, if you haven't ever heard the original one. Uh, this was preached back in 2011, November of 2011, so just about six years ago. I'm going over the notes again. It was an audio sermon originally, now it's going to be a video. So, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? You're going to see that thing with Christians that get established with meat. They'll argue over all kinds of weird stuff and extra biblical subjects and things like that though they'll, they'll really make problems and things and it's like you know what you really ought to go back and have some milk there all right and here's my point i'm trying to make with this study milk the bible's not condemning meat understand that meat is strong doctrine by the way if you don't understand this milk is just the simple basic things of scripture the basic things of your relationship to jesus christ all right that's what it's talking about there spiritually. We'll get into this more with the study. But here's the point I'm trying to make. Milk comes before meat. It's very important. You can't eat milk, or excuse me, you can't eat meat without a little bit of milk to wash it down. Um, but you can have milk by itself. All right? And of course, I'm speaking spiritually here, but you could also apply it to the physical realm. Uh, milk comes before meat. If you have a baby, that baby needs milk for the first, uh, you know, two, some people even say three years, you know. They need their mother's breast milk. They need to be nursed, All right? You wean the child, and then they're able to have other foods. And, of course, you can, you know, you can start having, you know, grinding up the meat and things like that. Uh, our son started eating um, ground-up fruits and things, uh, some bananas and red pears and a few other things minor things like that when he was about four months old. I uh, did very, very well on that. And uh, meat, I think we actually started giving him some ground up meat and mashed potatoes together. I think when he was about six months old. So um, did really well on it. But the whole point is, start out with milk. So what is biblical milk? Let's look about this. Genesis chapter 18, let's go way back to the beginning of the Bible. I would say that this is this milk versus meat thing is probably the number one problem uh, why there's so much strife in the body of Christ right now. Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door. And bowed himself toward the ground, and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort your, ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on, for therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do, as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened unto the tent unto Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran unto the herd, and fetched a calf tender and good, and gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk, and the calf which he had dressed, and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. Alright, so 
notice the four things there that these that you know Abraham basically um, had for the Lord when he appeared in a you know pre-incarnate form. There's very, kind of an interesting thing there. He gave him four things. What were they? Bread, butter, beef, essentially the calf there, and milk. So it's kind of an interesting little thing there. And the Bible is also called the bread, you know, the bread of life, essentially. So it's kind of an interesting symbolic picture there. Just thought that was a neat thing. Uh, the Bible is actually um, symbolically all four of those things. Kind of a neat thing. Uh, Genesis chapter 49 I could go off on a big thing. I see my original notes here. I had the whole thing about the raw milk issue and stuff like this and, you know, how the the milk came right from a cow. It wasn't pasteurized. And uh, I don't know if you ever know the process of how you pasteurize milk. I don't know if you know that or not. You just take a glass of milk and you go like this. See, so it went past your eyes. So, kind of a corny joke there. I'm sorry about that. All right. And actually, you hate it and you kill all the helpful bacteria in the milk, you know, and stuff like this. And, um, raw milk is actually very, very good. And again, you know, I just got to put in my little here. And that is, uh, you know, people will say, well, milk is bad and we can prove it's got this and, and it does all these things. Well, yeah, if you go with pasteurized milk, the stuff that's factory produced, you know, the, the cows in very squalid conditions and they're, and they're just there in their own, you know, dung and everything else. And they're, it's these big factory farms and they're pumping them full of steroids and antibiotics and all kinds of other stuff uh, and then they pasteurize the milk and homogenize it you know and all this other stuff yeah it's terrible it's really really bad for you but grass-fed raw milk uh, cows that are out in the pasture and things like that and they come in they milk them by hand or whatever or even you know the little machine or something that's done clean and done good it's one of the healthiest things out there uh, it's actually the only food that you can live completely on Okay, and you know, I mean, you could argue that and stuff. Well, you can do coconuts too and stuff. Yeah. Sure, but uh, it's uh, an interesting thing because milk is actually the one thing that all people have to start their life drinking milk. Hmm. Genesis forty-nine, verses one and two. If you're hearing some noises in the background here, by the way. It's a certain somebody that's downstairs right now that's supposed to be taking a nap and he's not doing a very good job. So, uh, ah, three year old children. Uh, Genesis chapter 49, verses 1 and 2. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. Again, Jacob and Israel are, you know, two names for the same man. Okay, so you hear the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, it's talking about the time of Israel's trouble. But let's go down to verse 8. Genesis chapter 49, verse 8 through 12. Judah is a lion's whelp, from the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion who shall rouse him up. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Uh, binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth white with milk. Oh, the Bible doesn't say to drink milk and things. Milk is bad. I, I see these people. You know, oh, the, you shouldn't drink milk. It's not good for your system. Excuse me? Uh, it's not good if you don't have milk, your mother's milk, as a baby. And then after that, drinking cow's milk is extremely good for you if it's the right kind of milk. But here you have a prophecy given of the Lord, and it says, His teeth white with milk. Hmm. And if you don't know about the thing of the line of the tribe of Judah, uh, Revelation 5 verse 5 says, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, and to loose the seven seals thereof. So, 
just thought that was an interesting little tie in there. A prophecy of the Lord, and it actually says that his teeth are white with milk. So yeah, milk's pretty important. You know, and of course you have a lot of uh, references in the Old Testament to a land flowing with milk and honey. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean that you go to some places over there in Israel and there's a there's a stream that's actually just milk flowing out of the ground or something? Well, no, of course not. What it's talking about is the grasses in that country are very, very lush and very good. And so you have cattle, they're going to have plenty of grass to eat. You're going to have lots of good milk. Some really, really good healthy milk, right? And if you understand a few things about science there, uh, good grass in a plain or whatever else, uh, when it rains, it's going to hold that rain in the ground. It's not going to just run off the top. The roots are going to hold it in there, and you're going to get um, really good fertile ground because of grass. So to say a land that flows with milk and honey, again, the honey, how do you get that? Well, from the bees, and they're having to go out and they pollinate the flowers to get the nectar and things and the pollen and all that stuff to make honey. So a land flowing with milk and honey means it's a very... Uh, lush, you know, plains and things like that. Song of Solomon. Go to Song of Solomon. I'm looking at another thing here about milk. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. Okay, it says here, My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among ten thousand. His head is as the most fine gold, his locks are bushy and black as a raven. His eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of waters, washed with milk and fitly set. So again, you see another reference there. You say, well, how can uh, you know his eyes be washed with milk? Well, it's not saying that you should wash your eyes with milk or anything like that, but it's just simply saying it's white like milk. Now, if they're not drinking milk, why well, use milk as an analogy for white eyes? Uh, yeah, you should have some milk in your diet. Uh, if you can get the raw milk, the pasteurized stuff, eh, we use it because we, we make recipes and stuff like that, and we can't get raw milk. We did for a little bit of time, and then that kind of fell through. But um, there's other ways, you know, you can get, uh, you can get raw milk cheese, raw milk butter, um, to get the helpful bacteria, but uh, we we do use some pasteurized milk for cooking purposes and things because even if we had raw milk, it gets cooked, you know, in the recipe and it essentially becomes pasteurized. But uh, we we don't even call it uh, milk; we call it white cooking liquid. So, it's a little inside joke for us. But First Peter chapter two verse two. You can turn there in your Bible next. We're going to see another reference to milk. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Sincere milk of the word. There are certain things that are very easy to understand. They're milk. It's just like, well, yeah, that's what the Bible teaches. We're going to be going over some of those today, and I'm going to show you the importance of uh, meat is fine. After you've been saved for a while, you're going to want some meat. You're going to want something a little bit more substantial. I mean, my son would not have been very happy if it would have just been milk and no meat. I remember even when he was little, he'd be sitting there playing, you know, on the floor or sitting in his high chair and, and I'd be, you know, cooking some meat or something like that. And he'd be turning around and he'd be reaching for the, you know, the frying pan and, you know, on the stove and he, uh, you know, just as a little baby, a couple months old, he's, I smell that meat. I want that. Well, you're too young right now. You need some milk, right? And a big mistake that a lot of early, you know, young Christians make is they say, I'm going to go right to the meat and not really get established with milk. That's a problem. And you'll understand too, as you get older as a Christian and you mature as a Christian, you'll appreciate the importance of milk. Yeah, I like meat, but I don't want the meat without the milk. I want to show you what I mean by that here in just a little bit. Matthew chapter 6.
Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 and 23. Now, if you remember in Song of Solomon there, it talked about, you know, the eyes, you know, white with milk and things. Well, desire the sincere milk of the word over in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 and 23 says here, The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine, if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If, there, if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? So this thought that was kind of an interesting little thing there. If the milk of the word is in you, your spiritual eyesight will be really good. All right. Interesting way to look at it. But is meat bad? I said earlier it's not. But let me show you a scripture on that. Hebrews chapter 5. funny because back when I preached this original study I was a single man and never thought I'd be married and have children or well a child a son um, but uh, you know it's kind of a different perspective now that I can preach this as a married father you know I can actually look at the thing and say I can understand the milk versus meat thing really good now <laughs> but uh, Hebrews chapter 5 verses 12 through 14 for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So there is a sense there, you can't always just live on milk, as a Christian, you do have to get to a point, you have to graduate up to the strong meat of the word. Sure, that's there. But you always have to keep that milk there. Keep that thing there in mind that the milk is there to help the meat, you know, help swallow the meat. All right. Now, let's drink some spiritual milk here. I had a thing here that I, I did, um, I don't even know if I have one up here, one of our old hymn books when we had Bible Believers Fellowship, um, but it's a familiar children's song, um, Jesus Loves Me, okay? Hymn number 708 in our Hymns Triumphant, I think is the, not Hymns Triumphant, I can't think of the name of the hymn book that we used to use, um, but you know, Jesus loves me, this I know, okay, that song. John chapter 3, verse 16. A very familiar one here. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You say, well, of course, I know that one. It's milk, you see. So when somebody comes out and they try to say, well, uh, maybe you didn't really get saved or maybe, you know, you've lost it because you've done this or that or whatever else. Uh, just go back to the milk, you see, a basic of Scripture. And you say, um, well, God loved me enough to send his son to die for me. I prayed and asked the Lord to save me and he saved me and my life changed. And, and yeah, I'm saved. You see? People say, well, let's debate the eternal security issue and let's go back and forth and come up with all these little things and what about this and what about that and whatever else. Just go to the simple basic teaching of Scripture right there. You have, eter you have everlasting life. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Romans 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? You know, and it goes down through and basically, no, there's nothing that's going to separate you from the love of Christ. Jesus loves me, this I know. Do you know that? I mean, if you're saved, do you keep that in mind? 
I mean, you kind of take it for granted. I take it for granted sometimes. You just kind of, well, the Lord saved me. I guess he loves me. And think, think of how great his love was for you. But let me throw another little thing into it. Okay? Not only is this a debate over eternal security, but think about this. Jesus loves me, this I know, but he's going to put me into the time of Jacob's trouble. I mean, you know, I'll just tell you a little story here. We went to the grocery store today. We actually did. And we're walking around and, uh, you know, I saw something that I didn't appreciate at the grocery store. So I just grabbed the display and knocked it over and smashed a bunch of things. And uh, there was a police officer in the store and they called him over and he came running over and he said, oh, who did this? And I pointed at my wife and I said, it's all her. She's the one that did it. And she kind of got a little bit upset and the police officer grabbed her and she tried to resist a little and he took her on the ground and just kind of slammed her head into the floor and things and, and uh, he was kind of roughing her up and I just stood there and went, huh, that's something. You say, what, did that really happen? No, I'm just, I'm making up a story to kind of prove my point here. Why on earth would Jesus Christ die pay for your sins, promises you eternal life, and then he puts you into a time period where he opens a seal and unleashes the Antichrist on you. <laughs> oh, but but you see, that we got, we got to get into all this strong meat doctrine, you know, post-trib versus pre-trib versus post-trib pre-wrath versus, you know, mid-trib. No, just go back to the milk, you see. You go back to the milk, you say, hey, Jesus loves me, this I know. You look and you say, Revelation, how does the whole thing get started? Jesus opens the first seal. And these posties, they get, they get so desperate, they're actually saying that the seals are not the Lord doing it. It's just what it's, it's you know, they'll go. Um, the Revelation 6 is what man does to, to the body of Christ. And then the trumpets and the vials is what God does to man or something. <sighs> Stupid, stupid. Read the scriptures. The Lamb is the one opening the seals. Jesus Christ opens the seals. He unleashes the Antichrist. War, famine, death, hell. And Jesus does that to his bride? Is that love? Somebody comes along and they try to argue with you over the timing of the rapture. You just say, whoa, wait a second here. Jesus loves me. This I know. I know he loves me. He wouldn't put me into that time where he's opening up the seals. I mean, how could that possibly be love? Jesus is there and, you know, like I said, with my little analogy, I'm standing there while police officers beating the living tar out of my wife, kicking her and stuff like this and tasing her and whatever. And I'm going, hmm, yeah, that's a shame. That wouldn't be loving. Not at all. Well, why would it be any different, you know, that if that would be wrong? Why would it be right for the Lord to allow his church to go through a time when that he's causing? He opens the seal. He releases the Antichrist on the world. Why? You know? And the same group that's saying, oh, it's, it's, we're going into the tribulation. We're going into the, this, this time and everything else. They also teach replacement theology. And you ask them about the Jews, they'll say, the Jews are wicked. They reject Jesus and they do all this horrible stuff. Well, then maybe the time period could be for them and not for the church. Anybody home? You know. Uh, the time of Jacob's trouble. Why? Because the Jews are very, very much hateful of Jesus Christ. They've rejected him as their Messiah. And the Lord's saying, I've had enough of this. You people, the blasphemous things that you say about me in the Talmud and all this other, these unscriptural writings and things. Okay, you want to do that? You want to have your sodomite pride parades over there in Israel, Tel Aviv and stuff, and the, all this other stuff and all the wickedness that they do? Okay, I'm going to bring my wrath and my judgment on you for seven years. That's what it's about. And Christians go, oh, no, no, it has to be about us. We have to get in on that too. You need to go back and have a little bit of milk. Jesus loves you. Loved you enough to die for you delivered you from an eternity in hell, why wouldn't he deliver you from the time of Jacob's trouble? Simple. Basic. 
Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Does it? John 17, 17, very familiar verse. Let's, I mean, we're looking at, we're looking at milk. We are looking at basic, basic doctrine here. John 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now, from just a purely logical standpoint, okay, is it logical for me to say, this is God's word, but it's just a translation and there are errors in it? Okay, well, if that's the truth, then God made mistakes, or I'm smart enough that, you know, I can look at these things and I can say, well, it should have been translated differently. And say, well, then how can it be God's word? If it's got mistakes in it, if it's got errors in it, how can it be from God? And how can you really know for sure that you're even saved? If you can't trust uh, 1 John 5, 7, or you can't trust uh, some other verses here and there, Acts 8, 37, or some other verse, you can't trust that. That shouldn't be in there or whatever. Well, then how can you trust anything? Throws the whole thing off. Well, I know Jesus loves me. How do you know? I know because the Bible tells me so. I have a Bible. And you know, all these new version people, see the, the philosophy of the new versions is, it's not, we have a perfect Bible here with the, uh, you know, trying to look down here and get another one. Uh, okay, I'll just grab this one. We have a perfect Bible with the Holman Christian Standard Bible right there. The HCSB. This is the perfect Word of God. They don't believe that. They don't believe it for one minute. You say, well, no, but the, uh, the Nestles. The Nestles text. We got the Nestles text right here. You know, we got the, uh, let's see if I make sure I got the right one. We got the 27th edition. This is God's pure, preserved words. No, wait. Uh, actually, no. Um, let me rephrase that. They, we, got, we got the 28th edition now. You know, here's the 25th edition. Or maybe it's the uh, Textus Receptus. Uh, no. <laughs> maybe it's the book that you can hold in your hands and you can preach it and teach it and people's lives can be changed by it. Maybe just maybe it's that one. You know? Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verses 3 through 4. For what if some did not believe? This crowd over here. Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, and but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Mark that one down, brethren. That is a good milk verse right there. You just keep that thing in the forefront of your mind when somebody comes along and they say, the King James Bible is just a translation. It's got glosses in it. <laughs> You know, and minuscule this and majuscule that, and, and this manuscript, the papyri, papyri fragment proves that the and the this and the that and the Johannine comma was not originally in the oldest copies and the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus and the, and the blah, 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 all this dumb stupid nonsense. As it is written, hold up the written word of God, show it to me. And it cracks me up. These Alexandrian perverts, the James Whites and all these other guys, they come out and they say, we, we believe the Bible's our final authority. <laughs> it's like, you bunch of stupid liars. They don't believe it for one minute. But you see, their viewers are so gullible that they'll sit there and go, wow, he's the greatest Christian apologist alive today. Yeah, and he doesn't even believe in the book that he teaches from. It's insane. It is written... Let God be true and every man a liar, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings. How do you be justified in your sayings if this is continually changing and in transition? 
are you going to be justified? Well, it was true yesterday, but maybe not tomorrow. Nope. It's true. And mightest overcome when thou art judged. You're going to be judged as a Bible-believing Christian. They're going to tell you that you're narrow-minded, that you're bigoted, that you're divisive, that you're whatever. But you can go right back to the milk and you can say, you know what? Without even getting into all the meat and everything else, and there are scores and scores and scores of books. I mean, so many books here, all this stuff up in here, you know, all these different books, and I've read most of them on the Bible version issue, and what about this, and what about that reading, and what about this argument, and what about that. That's meat, you see? Meat. Look at that big shelf of meat right there. Okay, and I got the stuff down here too, King James Only Converse, Controversy, both editions from Jimbo White there, Jesuit White, and the NIV story and the King James Version debate by uh, D.A. Carson. And I got, I got both sides, you know. I don't collect a whole lot of the idiot's books over there. But, you know, here's a big shelf of meat right here. You say, i got to have that for my library to be a full Christian, complete Christian. No, you don't. No, you don't. Just go to a milk verse, John 17, 17, Romans chapter 3, verses 3 through 4. Just milk. That's all you need. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Simple. What's the next line? Turn to Romans chapter 8. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. Romans 8 verses 14 through 18. Little ones to him belong. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him. You will suffer in this life. That we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Do you realize, Christian, a hundred years from now, I fully believe that we're going to be in the Millennial Kingdom a lot sooner than a hundred years. But let's just play it safe, okay? One hundred years from now, you will be in a glorified body, walking around on this earth. Jesus Christ sitting over in Jerusalem. No Catholics on the earth. No Catholic church. No Buddhist temple. No Muslim mosques. No Greek Orthodox structures or satanic churches or witchcraft or think about that in a hundred years less than that actually playing it safe here I'm being conservative walking around in an incorruptible body ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ on the earth carrying out his orders the Bible says we'll reign as kings and priests Just a short time away. Rapture. How soon is that going to happen? I don't know. I hope soon. Could be a few years yet. I, I have no idea. But when the rapture happens, in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, up you go. No matter what's happening, no matter how bad things are, all of a sudden, boom. And Lord haste the day when my faith shall be sight. And there you are, up in the clouds, and you go, whoa, it's all real. And we're all looking at, you know, it, you know, everybody's like, oh, it's going to be so neat. We get to heaven, we're going to be like in the rapture and everything, you know, we're going to be up there with the clouds, called up to meet the Lord in the air, you know, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, and we're going to be like looking around going, hey, hi, and hugging each other. And stuff. I don't think it's going to be that at first. I think at first it's just going to be like, we're going to be looking at each other like, and it's going to finally dawn on, dawn on us like, whoa, okay, <laughs> you know, it's going to be something else. And then get to see Jesus for the first time. 
How about that? Pretty good. How far away is it? I don't know. Probably not too far off. Can't imagine the Lord's going to put up with this sin-cursed world much longer. But, you know, uh, it's really something. Possibly a few years from now, rapture. Less than 100 years from now, millennial, king, millennial kingdom. Walking around, Jesus is on the throne in Jerusalem. You know, no worries about a corrupt election. You know, some guy gets elected. And you go, oh, man, I thought we had enough votes to get Jesus back in this year. You know, <laughs> you know, little Jesus campaign stickers, you know, campaign signs out in the yard, you know, and stuff. Vote Jesus, you know, or something. No, no, thousand years. He's ruling on the throne. You say, uh, do you think we should vote somebody else? No. No. thousand years. Right there. It's going to be wonderful. And after the thousand years, what do we get? Eternity. And your problems are what again? I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the, with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Little ones to him belong. You know what I'm saying? Here's a child. Oh, we, we might go into the, into the tribulation and, and the, the mark of the beast. And, uh, what in the world are you worried about? My dad's not going to do that. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 8. It says here, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Now that's true in any dispensation. This thing, that truth there crosses dispensational lines. You'll see it in the Garden of Eden, the whole way through to the end of the book of Revelation. God will chasten those that are his. He'll punish you. So yeah, it'll, it'll show up in the church age. It shows up here for the people, the Hebrews in the time of Jacob's trouble. It's true for anybody. All right. The point being there. Him with our father, him having God as your father, he will chasten you because he loves you. We belong to him. Little ones to him belong. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. It says here that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. You know, there have been times I have made a promise to my son, and he does wrong, and my promise is I'm going to give you you know, uh, something. We stopped at a place on the way down to the new property that we bought, and they sell maple sugar candy, maple syrup and things like this. And I got this little couple pieces of maple sugar candy, and he didn't want any at first. You know, he was screaming and freaking out. You know, no, 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 I don't want this maple sugar candy. And I finally just stuck a little piece in his mouth, and, and all of a sudden it was, ah, oh, you know, <laughs> now he wants some. And so now, you know, occasionally, you know, after he does good with supper time or whatever else, you know, maple sugar candy. And, you know, uh, and there's been times I've said, you know what, you do a good job with your meal or whatever or you whatever. And I say, I'm going to give you a piece of that candy or I'm going to if he I'll say it this way. There have been times when I have promised him. You're going to get a piece of this later on, OK, because you did such and such. Then I forget about it or something else. And that time comes and he reminds me, hey, I'm supposed to have that thing there, Dad, you promised. And if I've promised him, 
I believe I'm supposed to keep my word. And so there have been times I've said, you know what, I'm going to give you this or I'm going to give you something else because I gave you my word that I was going to. Again, am I more just than God the Father? No, I'm not. He's perfect. He's holy. He's righteous. He promises us certain things. In our text here, we are promised eternal life. We're promised we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, if you go into that time of Jacob's trouble, you can take the mark of the beast, which you're instructed in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, that you're to provide for your own. How can you provide if you can't buy or sell? You see? Oh, well, we're going to be growing organic vegetables out in the backyard to live off of for seven years while all the green grass is burned up and the, you know everything else is falling apart and all the trees, you know, a third of the trees burned and all the water is turning to blood and all this other stuff. We're going to be growing you know, fruits and vegetables at the time. No, I don't think so. It's going to be a terrible time period. That's how you know that you're not going to be there, Christian, because God is the one who's making it terrible. He's pouring out His wrath and His judgment and fury upon the nation of Israel for the kind of wicked stuff that they say about Jesus Christ right now. There's a lot of rabbis. I've tried to watch some of the stuff from rabbis and things like that to kind of get a better idea of Judaism and things. I can't watch some of them. I get too angry. It makes my blood boil. I support the nation of Israel's right to that land over there, but I'll tell you what, there's some really wicked people. There's some really, really wicked Jews that hate Jesus Christ. And I look at those guys and I say, you know what? Have a good time in the time of Jacob's trouble, buddy. The wicked stuff you say about my Savior, Jesus Christ, have a good time in that time period that's coming. Yep. As far as me, as far as I'm concerned, I can understand the milk of the Word and say, you know what? I'm a son of God. He's my father. I'm adopted. I'm born in with a spirit of adoption. I don't have to worry about my father, my heavenly father, putting me into that time of Jacob's trouble. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Sticking with our song here. Philippians 4.13. Turn there. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Hmm. If any movement tries to give you strength apart from Christ, it is satanic. I have written here. Very true. I still stand by that statement six years later. Yeah. Anything that tries to give you strength, any, anything that tries to help you out and whatever else apart from, and it's not a um, uh, you know, in line with the scriptures and whatever else. Um, it's, it's not of the Lord. Just as simple as that. And again, you know, when you have a problem and things and you don't, you kind of, your courage starts to falter or, or whatever else, the Bible says you can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. We are weak, but He is strong. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. Again, more very convicting scripture here. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength, we are weak, he is strong. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Amazing. You say, well, that's, that's kind of a deep thing. Not really. Not really. It's milk. You just kind of get a little bit prideful sometimes and you kind of think to yourself, I should be able to fight my way through this. You know, I've seen that thing, you know, again, uh, so interesting doing this study now. And, and I mean, because I just I go right off the notes. I'm not listening to my old message first and then trying to do it as similar. 
no, it's totally new, but with the old notes. And it's so weird, you know, being a father now and having my own son and seeing how he does things. And there's many, many times I'm like, hey, son, let me help you do whatever. And he's just like, eh, you know, he just, no, I'm going to, you know, he wants to do it himself. Do it by myself. Do it by myself. You know, he, he comes out with that. Do it by myself. You know, <laughs> he wants to do it himself. And I've seen seen him take some really bad falls and he fall out, wham, on the floor, you know. He's climbing up on something. I say, don't stand on that chair. You know, wham, down he goes. And I go, you should have listened to me. And, you know, there's been times I got mad. I'm like, why don't you listen to me, son? You know, do you have some little pride issue here, son? And it's just like I do that. And it's like the Lord's standing back there over my shoulder, you know, kind of. <laughs> and it's like the Lord's going, what about you? You know? Oh, yeah. You know, there's that. There's many times I try to do things in my own strength. Why? Pride? Yeah. I struggle with that thing. There's been many, many times I, you know, the Lord's just like, you know, don't do that. And I go ahead and do it. <laughs> it's stupid. Prideful. And I have to learn sometimes that uh, I'm awfully weak. But my God is strong. My Heavenly Father is very strong. Sometimes I try to get some meat down and uh, I really need to have a little bit of uh, milk first. Go back to remember, uh, hey, uh, Brian, you're weak. Oh, no, I'm strong. I, I'm, I'm a, you know, ex-logger and I, I'm six foot three and 220 pounds. I am. And, you know, and I can do, I'm, I can lift this stuff and everything. Uh, you're weak. You're a frail little creature. Your strength is supposed to come from God. Let's continue. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. I have a couple of things written out here. I'll just read these. As a Christian, you, number one, are saved and sealed. You have eternal security, not of your works, but by faith. Very true. Number two, you have a final written authority. You have a perfect Bible. King James Bible for English-speaking Christians and whatever variation there is in your language if you don't speak English. Of course, if you don't speak English, you're probably not understanding too much of what I'm saying right now. Uh, number three, you are a child of God. You will be spared from God's wrath through the rapture. Caught out before that time happens. Number four, you have strength through Jesus Christ. You will have trials and difficulties, and you will suffer. And you will, especially as time goes by. I mean, it just, it is insane. <laughs> the levels of, of vexation and things. I mean, like I said, I've, I've did a, you know, I did a video not long ago um, about the thing of horrible, weird, twisted nightmares that a lot of Christians are having. And, and uh, I was just, I was shocked by how many people are writing in the comments and going, yeah, I'm just like, I don't know what to do. I'm like afraid to go to sleep. And I'm waking up going like, what in the world was that? I mean, I, I've never seen movies with this stuff in it. I've never, I've never thought these thoughts before. And there's weird stuff coming into my head. I mean, I've been struggling with this thing now for a couple of years, but I mean, I, I do good for a little bit of time. I sleep good. Other times it's like three, four nights in a row. I'm sleeping I feel like I'm sleeping good, but I wake up and I'm just going like, I don't even feel like I slept last night. I'm just walking around in it, just like in a daze, just like, uh, you know, and terrible nightmares all night long. It's crazy the times that we live in. And I, you know, I'm not alone. You're not alone if you're going through the same thing. Uh, it's, it's downright terrifying sometimes. We are having that last little bit of time to suffer as Christians in this extremely wicked world. This world is just getting worse and worse and worse. It's not going to get any better. Um, well, then what, we, what should we do? Well, we need, to, we need to be established with meat. We just have to go around and just be eating meat. I want to, I want to just... And it, it is so tempting 
on YouTube, you know, just go and I want to find out about all these, all this meat doctrine, you know, all these really, really strong sermons and stuff like this. That stuff's okay. But you always got to go back to the milk of the word. Remember the basics, brethren. Uh, remember how that Jesus Christ died for you, how he saved you. You're eternally secure. You're his child. Your strength, you're weak. I don't care how big you are, how, how tough you think that you are and everything else. Um, you can get knocked down really quickly. All right, your flesh is extremely weak. Yeah. Your strength needs to come from Jesus Christ. Don't think that you can go out in your pride and say, Hey, I got this. I got this. All right, I can do this thing myself. Lord, I don't need your help. You need to get into the habit of praying about everything. Okay? I mean, I'm trying to do it more and more and more. Just pray about every little thing out there. And just talking to the Lord. And it doesn't mean prayer. You know, you get down on your knees and you, and you got to do it. Just talking. He's, he's your Heavenly Father. You know, talk with Him. Have a good conversation with the Lord. Just walking around, you know, throughout the day. And you, can, you don't have to be saying it out loud all the time. But, you know, just walking around, just like, Lord, you know, just... Oh, I'm sorry about that, Lord. I forgot my, what I was saying. But anyhow, getting back to what I was saying, Lord, I mean, I don't understand the... Is there something I need to be doing? Is there is there something I can do here to help with this these weird dreams things, Lord? I mean, and it just talk to him. Talk to him. Basics, brethren. You see? So that is going to be it for this study. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you um, that we have uh, such precious promises in your word. And um, such basic, simple truths, but they're, they're so profound when we think about them that uh, the God of heaven, the God of the universe, actually wants to have a personal relationship with us and, and we can talk to you at any time. I thank you for that, Lord. And I just pray for strength, Lord, for the body of Christ out there. I know that everybody's struggling. It's just, it is really, really rough out there and so vexing. And it just gets worse by the day, by the hour. And uh, Lord, I pray that you wouldn't... Uh, Make us wait much longer. I pray, Lord, that the rapture would be soon and, and that uh, your children would be caught up and be with you, Lord. Uh, we're really looking forward to it. And I can't wait for the millennial kingdom and I can't wait for eternity, Lord. It's just such amazing promises. And I pray that you would help us to keep those things in mind. And I just ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, that is going to be it for that one. Another uh, study that I've been able to redo there. Um, just a few little announcements here I'll make, and then I'm going to be probably doing another um, study. But um, we're just, uh, you know, I'm going to be, I'm doing some studies here and there along with, you know, I'm doing some research for upcoming sermons, but it's mostly going to be sermons that are re-preached and things. Um, and they're, you know, very, very good stuff that the Lord helped me with way back you know, years and years and years ago, early part of the ministry. Again, you know, people, oh, your ministry's changed so much. No, I'm not even having to redo my notes that I did six years ago. Preached, you know, six years ago or more. So, uh, no, the ministry's not really changed. People are changing, but, uh, you know, whatever. But um, we're uh, staying real busy with the thing of uh, building some things, working at the new property and, and things like that. It's probably going to be a while before we're actually moving and changing addresses and things. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of detail, but we'll keep people somewhat posted on that. But um, just uh, really do covet your prayers. just want to say uh, very quickly, uh, my wife has a few prayers that she's, you know, uh, she, she'd like some sisters out there to pray for, and brethren too, if you know any brothers or sisters out there that want to pray for my wife. Um, just unspoken prayer requests. Just some things that she has on her mind and things like that. Um, just, you know, personal stuff. I don't even know what they are, you know, but it's just stuff between her and the Lord. And, um, you know, so if you could just remember uh, Sister Catherine, um, just please uh, just pray. Just say, Lord, you know, whatever these unspoken prayer requests are, you know, just please. Um, I pray that you'd answer them, you know, and uh, have your will be done there. So if you could do that, I'd really appreciate that. Uh, 
you know, because these are some things that are very important to her. So um, enough on that. But uh, we just, uh, I just want to encourage the brethren out there because I know uh, we're getting a lot of letters and things from people and just saying there's days that you just, you think to yourself, how can I keep going on like this? And this world is just so bad and, and it just, <laughs> it gets really vexing. Oh my word, it gets so bad. But you know, um, looking through my stack of notes, old things I want to preach again, you know, and I saw that one, I thought, you know, I need to get this one out. Um, you know, Halloween is just a few days away from now and, and, um, which is always a terrible time. And there's, there's satanic ritual stuff that goes on too. I mean, don't kid yourself. I remember when I was down in Lancaster County, probably about, uh, the time, you know, I was doing that study there. Uh, it was before I was married as a single guy, and, and they were talking about, you know, people's pets are disappearing, you know, before Halloween, you know, and we don't know what's going on, and why are people kidnapping animals? And I'm like, <laughs> they're they're killing them. It's satanic rituals. There was a whole area down in Lancaster County. I um, can't think of the name of the road. It was a 322, I think, up along 322, down through Brickerville, and you go out, you know, like uh, heading, brother, I don't even remember, I guess that would be west. But anyways, you get down there and there's this huge area of all these big rocks and, you know, they call it the potato patch. And I went there the one time and uh, me and a brother, a friend from Bible Believers Fellowship, we went there and there was just like, you know, satanic, you know, graffiti like everywhere. I mean, it was insane. All kinds of witchcraft stuff and everything else. And different people were saying that there's, you know, ritual type of stuff that goes on there. It's going on all over the country, okay? Um, and you're going to feel some of that. I'm just going to warn you in advance. As a Christian, you're probably going to feel some of that vexation, just like, ugh, you know. Um, and, you know, if you feel some of that, you feel that you're getting attacked. Um, don't say, well, you know, I think I'll pray about it later on. You know, we sit down for a meal in two hours. No, 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 no. Pray right then. And just say, Lord, I don't know what's going on right now, but I pray that you turn whatever this is. If I'm getting cursed by witches or whatever. Turn it back on them, Lord. Just please, Lord, protect me. Stop this thing from happening. Uh, it's real. Spiritual warfare is extremely real. And uh, again, a lot of people just don't want to think about that. You know, and it's like, well, <laughs> you need to think about it because we're in a world where a lot of people hate Christians. So uh, just give you a little heads up there with the whole Halloween thing coming up. It is a high satanic holiday, and this one's very significant because you have the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses to the door at uh, Wittenberg, I think it was, you know, way back there that supposedly started this Reformation thing and all that. So it's a significant year, and, um, you know, I mean, you can see things really, really taking shape. Uh, just went into a, <coughs> excuse me, went into this little, um, you know, uh, grocery store down in uh, Holton, south of us here in Maine, the town of Holton, and this grocery store, I mean, not a very big store or anything else, and they got self-checkout lines in there now, and I'm just going, <laughs> sure, why not? You know? Again, I remember people back when self-checkout lines came in, and people were like, you know, just going crazy, going like, that's the mark of the beast thing. You know, you're going to be able to go through and scan your hand and all this other stuff and biometrics and stuff. And it's becoming more and more and more popular. Uh, just, it's crazy. Little small country grocery store. And look, self-scanning. And they got all, it's like all, I mean, you can, you can buy groceries with PayPal money now. You know, local grocery stores here. And I'm going, huh, you know. So that's going to be it for this study. Um, never forget the milk, brethren. Uh, just remember the basics of Scripture. All right? So we will see you in the next video. Thank you for watching.